Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to the fourth day, the first session in the morning. Uh, we're very happy to have Christoph Schweigert from Hamburg University, who is going to tell us about string net methods for conformal field theory correlators. Uh, Christoph? Okay, thank you, Hisham. Thank you very much for the invitation to this nice workshop. It's, in a sense, not my first time here, but my first time was online. <laughs> And we had to cancel the trip in the last minute, so... Just before COVID. Yes. This was, I think it was the first conference that was canceled for COVID in my case. And we were still hoping that in summer it would be over. Okay, so it's great to be here. And uh, so what I want to tell you is related in many ways, although maybe a bit indirectly to things we've seen earlier this week. And I went back to think about CFT correlators, which, was, which is actually a topic I was thinking about for many, many years. And recent developments enabled some simplifications and new insights. Now, this is not a CFT conference, so I want to explain the problem I want to address, and then actually I want to convince you that one of the essential things uh, that helps you to understand this is really a scheme theoretic construction, or if you wish, a string net construction for pivotal bicategories. And that the covariance of these constructions for different input data allows you to understand CFT correlators, so correlators in the quantum field theory. And, well, the last chapter here that will be only at the very end of the talk, so I will spend a lot of time to set up the stage. Well, okay, let me very briefly tell you about two-dimensional conformal field theory. And probably the most important thing you should keep in mind is that if people talk about two-dimensional CFT, these are two different mathematical theories they have in mind. There is chiral CFT and there is something I'd like to call full local CFT. So chiral CFT is the theory you have in mind if you're talking about conformal blocks. Um, so it's the theory physicists have in mind if they talk about quantum Hall states. Um, full CFT is the theory people have in mind if they talk about sigma models, which happen to be conformal. It's what people have in mind if they are talking about Vesumino Witten models as models which have as a target space um, uh, a Lie group, say a compact, simple, connected Lie group. Uh, and these are mathematically rather different things. So chiral CFT is a theory which is defined on a complex curve, so on a compact one-dimensional complex manifold. And these complex, uh, the, the chiral, the, the conformal blocks are sheaves, well actually vector bundles with a connection uh, on the moduli space of curves and they are solutions of chiral ward identities. And they come with a connection, so they lead to multi-valued functions of positions of um, insertions and the complex structures. And since they are multi-valued, they cannot be physical correlators, but uh, they have interesting monotromies which can be described. And they have a fact property that, uh, well, if you go in this complex analytic language to a curve with an ordinary double point and you do a blow up, then these conformal blocks behave well. That's called factorization. And that also leads to structure we will capture then in modular functors. Well, a full CFT, as you find it, for example, for a sigma model or what people had in mind when they tried to approach elliptic homology in terms of some field theories, that's also full CFT. Um, that's defined on a different class of manifolds. That's defined on conformal surfaces. And actually, to understand the structure, it's helpful to admit surfaces with boundaries and uh, to admit also line defects and uh, so to work on stratified. Um, manifolds, and secondly, there, there are two variants. There's actually a variant of full CFT on oriented surfaces and on unoriented surfaces. I won't talk about the unoriented case here. 
In this setting, you have to do two tasks. You have to describe the fields in your theory, and we will do this. And then you have to pick for the fields correlators, which means that you have to find specific conformal blocks and to do this in a way that they are single valued, so they give rise to real functions, uh, sorry, to true functions, and they obey sewing constraints, so they are compatible with factorization. And this is the problem I want to solve using the language of modular functors to describe chiral CFTs via their monotromies. Okay, so a brief crash course on the chiral CFT. So these uh, chiral board identities are captured by an algebraic structure, uh, which was mentioned briefly in discussions, and uh, a vertex algebra. You don't know, have to know what a vertex algebra is for this talk. Imagine a commutative algebra, and if you have a commutative algebra, then uh, you get a representation category and a representation category, which is even a monoidal category. It is not symmetric in this case, it is braided, but that's uh, hidden in this word vertex algebra. I should point out that choosing the representation category can be quite subtle. So it's like Lie algebras. Lie algebras have many uh, representations, and you have to be careful what to choose. But what do we want to get? Well, we want to get a category, well, which is k linear. K in applications, k is the field of complex numbers, but that's not really crucially depending on the field, what I'm saying here. Um, if you are talking about a rational CFT, it's semi simple. A lot of the setup I'm going to present doesn't use semi simple, but um, if you have questions about this, I, I will explain where, uh, how to do it if in a non-semi-simple case. Uh, then it's monoidal, as I mentioned. Ma I mentioned. It, is, it has rigid duals. That's actually th the weak point about our assumption, because um, uh, typically the representation category of a vertex algebra doesn't have rigid duals. It has a weaker duality structure. Uh, it is actually star autonomous, or what people now these days also call Croton de Quartier. Uh, but we, we take rigid duals here. And then it is braided, and the braiding has a certain non degeneracy condition, which in the rational case is phrased as the S matrix is invertible, but I will use it very implicitly, and I'm not going to spell it out. Now, I'm encoding the monotromies of the conformal blocks in terms of something that's quite familiar to you. So I'm encoding this in terms of a, what I want to call an open closed modular functor. So I'm introducing two by categories, and actually I'm cheating a bit. It's more convenient in, in real life not to work with by categories, but with double categories, but I'm not going to explain this here. So I take here bordisms where the objects are, um, well, compact, one-dimensional manifolds. They can have here um, boundaries, so the interval is admitted. Obviously, to get it monoidal, I need the empty set. Then the one morphisms are um, surfaces with boundary, and the two morphisms are homeomorphisms up to homotopy. And the target we take is pro functors, and uh, the objects are k-linear categories, and the morphisms are pro functors or bimodules, if you wish, and natural transformations. We are enriched in VECT, so I don't have to tell you a lot about the natural transformations. And if you are familiar with double categories, you know that double categories have two types of one morphisms. So here for pro functors, pro functors are a double category, which, uh, so, so this category of uh, linear, this double category of k-linear categories. One uh, type of one morphisms are pro-functors, the others are functors. Yeah? And here, um, uh, one type of one morphisms are, um, well, manifolds with boundaries, and the other type of one morphisms are embeddings. So we keep embeddings, which is very convenient because covariance under embeddings is an important feature of quantum field theory. Alex has mentioned this in his talk, so that's in here. Okay, now 
what we want to deal with is, oops, sorry, is um, to, to write down a specific element in this space of conformal blocks in the following situation. So we take this complex surface, actually we will work in the topological category, so all this motivation, uh, talking com complex analytic is not, um, it's got rid by some Riemann-Hilbert correspondence. And here for, you see an example of such a surface. So it's oriented, it is stratified, so you see here these line defects, and um, the line defects partition the surface into two cells. The two cells are labeled, well, if we fix such a modular tensor category, they are labeled by special symmetric Frobenius algebras in C. So here we have chosen two of them. And um, then the line defects are bimodules, labeled by bimodules over these uh, Frobenius algebras, and the point defects uh, are labeled by bimodule. Morphism. So we immediately work in a stratified setting and you will see that this is very important even if you're not interested in defects. Uh, that's in a sense the new physical insight at the end of the talk. Okay, so uh, now um, uh, you have to find um, for the, the one uh, manifold, you have to find objects in categories. So to the interval you will associate C to the circle, not very surprisingly if you think in terms of factorization homology, you associate the Trinfeld center of C and it is known for many reasons that the boundary fields are in uh, inner homes and here, for example, this boundary field at this interval, well, I have here M1, M2, these are two modules. X1 is a bimodule, so, and I look at this inner home, that's the correct object for our boundary fields. And for the circle, we are using a module category structure over the monoidal category Z of C. Um, which is given on a category of module functors, so these are inner homes um, in some category of module functors. So that's all known and we use it. And um, now what we want to do is we want to construct some modular functor which gives us for this world sheet calligraphic S, uh, which gives us um, a vector space and we want to construct one specific vector in this vector space and this vector should be compatible with Ewing, so that's composition of one morphisms and, and it should be invariant under the mapping class group where the mapping class group here of the underlying surface, that's something you know and you can wonder what is the mapping class group if I endow the surface with such a stratification and possibly your first guess is that this mapping class group is the subgroup of those elements that preserve the defects, but that's wrong. And I will show you that that's essentially the question how to define the mapping class group. That's what triggered all uh, this approach in the end. So, okay, good. So what I'm now going to do is I'm doing some scheme theoretic work. And um, I start with a pivotal bi-category and I'm going to define pivotal bi-category. And one convenient uh, uh, way to deal with pivotal bi-categories is a graphical calculus. So I should define what I mean by graphical calculus here. And then the slogan for the construction of a modular functor is that the string net modular functor is a globalized version of the graphical calculus. But for the moment we are just uh, locally concerned with these pivotal by categories. So I don't think I have to explain to this audience what a by category is. Let me point out that a bi category has homomorphism categories which I'm writing, for which I'm using these two notations just uh, to introduce the notation and the bi categories I deal with are k-linear in this talk. They are not necessarily abelian. And well, now 
if you are thinking about uh, by categories, maybe you think in terms of pasting diagrams. So this here would be um, vertical composition of uh, two morphisms. And if you take these two, this would be a horizontal composition of two morphisms. I will prefer to take the Poincaré dual picture and talk about string diagrams, but I guess you're all familiar with string diagrams. Let me just point out two things that if you look at a string diagram, and that's already in the classic paper by Joyal and Street, yeah, really uh, these two directions have a different meaning. Here you are tensoring, here you are composing. We've seen a more complicated version of this in Niels Kack Wills talk. And then you have an evaluation which evaluates such a diagram to a morphism from the tensor product or from the horizontal composition of these two uh, one morphisms into the horizontal composition of these two one morphisms. And this evaluation works by projection and then concatenation. So that's. Uh, and I think you also know what uh, adjunction in, for one morphism means. So if you are given two one morphisms between two different objects, which I graphically denote in, uh, in this uh, string uh, pic um, diagram picture in this way, then an adjunction is exhibited by a co-unit and a unit sorry, a unit and a co-unit. So these are two morphisms and they obey um, the zigzag relation. So I think Niels Kack will would say the Zorro relations. So, um, okay, and then they are said to be adjoints. And in this way, uh, I can co consider in any bi-category adjoints. Now, what is a pivotal structure? A pivotal structure on a bi-category, suppose you have fixed uh, left and right adjoints, and having adjoints is a property, and um, fixing them is uh, essentially unique. Then it is an identity component, pseudo-natural transformation, uh, such um, uh, which relates the identity functor to the double dual. So it's a trivialization of the double dual. So which means that this um, two morphism here and this two morphism, uh, that the two are the same because I can put one of these uh, double right duals to the left and then this implies that I can identify left and right duals. This will have important consequences for the graphical calculus. Well, okay, and we will work with strict pivotal bi-categories. Uh, so these are pivotal bi-categories where this natural transformation can be chosen to be the identity. This raises questions about strictification results. Uh, for one of the bi-categories we are using, there's a strictification result proven by Schaunburg and Nge, but let's assume strictly pivotal here. Okay, what are the examples we want to keep in mind? Suppose uh, you give me a pivotal tensor category. A pivotal tensor category is a tensor category where you have a monoidal isomorphism between the identity functor and the double dual. It's a rigid monoidal category where you have this um, additional structure. And I should tell you that any modular tensor category, whether it's semi-simple or not, is pivotal. On the other hand, it's an open question whether any fusion category admits a pivotal structure. So it's a famous open problem in the field. It looks surprisingly hard. Well, you can turn any monoidal category in a bi-category by taking the one object bi-category and as endomorphism simply the monoidal category. That's a pivotal bi-category unsurprisingly. And the second pivotal by category that we have in the game is a pivot is you fix here a pivotal a tensor category it can be modular if you wish, and the objects are uh, symmetric Frobenius algebras. They are actually simple special symmetric Frobenius algebras. Simple meaning that the bi module. Um, morphisms from A as a bimodule over itself to, its, uh, to A is just, are just multiples of the uh, identity and uh, special means that the multiplication has an, uh, 
one-sided inverse as a bimodule map. That's uh, as in classical algebra. And uh, well, the morphism categories are given by bimodules, AB bimodules. So now we've seen if you are in a bi category, the natural um, graphical calculus is two framed, so you have two different directions which you should keep apart. And it is progressive in the sense that here the strands for the one morphism, they have to run upwards and they are not allowed to bend. If you want to use dualities, you have to explicitly uh, insert it. The pivotal by category means that you can drop the two qualifiers, you can drop progressive and you can drop the word two framed. So you can turn these boxes which represent morphisms and you can turn the, um, uh, these um, lines because now the duality behaves well. That's the slogan and I will make the graphical calculus more concrete on, in the next few slides. So what is the upshot is that while for by category you should think in terms of boxes which have an x axis and a y axis, for the pivotal by category, the natural graphical calculus is formulated on oriented disks. And let me formulate this. And so what I'm doing is I'm repackaging the information on a pivotal by category in terms of a graphical calculus on, um, on disks. Okay. Good. So uh, let me do this a bit more formally and let me formulate the graphical calculus as a symmetric monoidal functor. I don't have to explain the target, that's simply vector spaces. The source take into account this disk-like shape. So that's a category of corollas. So, oops, this was the wrong. So what is this category of corollas? Well, the, the objects are, apart from the empty set, they are corollas. So these are these wheels. And uh, so you have a point in the center. You're connecting this point of the center with finitely many lines to the outer circle. You're labeling then, uh, the corollas are labeled by a by category. So the two patches are labeled by objects in the by category. These one lines are labeled by um, 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 one morphisms, the corresponding one morphisms in the by category. And let's talk about the labeling of the vertex a bit later. Of course, it will be related to two morphisms. Now, um, uh, the monoidal structure is disjoint union, so you have actually, yeah? Please interrupt me by shouting. Yeah. Hi. Um, so are, are these diagrams given by co-spans of finite sets appropriately labeled, um, or these, uh, the compositions, the morphisms? I didn't talk about the, com uh, the, the morphisms so far. Sorry. Yeah, I, let me talk about the, the morphisms and then we can think of whether it can be reformulated in this way. I just explained what the objects are. Okay, good. So what are the morphisms? So uh, a morphism here is represented by this graphical gadget. So, so you see, here the outer boundary gives clearly rise to corolla because if you take here the points of the outer boundary, you can simply, simply continue the lines and to form this corolla here because on the outer boundary you have this light blue, purple, green, purple, green, that's exactly what I have here. What's marked inside, uh, and you see the operatic nature of what I'm going to define here, is um, yeah, I have these two gray uh, disks, these shaded disks, that's important information. You see that the boundary of this shaded disk has exactly the same data as the boundary of this corolla. And here, this uh, corolla can be glued in here. That's a morphism. Yeah? And that's a morphism from the tensor product of these two objects into this object. 
And I should also explain what composition of morphisms is. Composition of morphisms is, uh, I'm for take, composing this morphism with this morphism, you are realizing that the outer boundary of this corolla is exactly what you have here as the, outer, as the boundary of this gray shaded disk. So you can glue this disk instead of the gray thing. And then you see that we are getting here this morphism. That's a composition. Okay, so this is a category which I'm setting up. And um, you, um, it's simply catching the right combinatorics. Everything is planar here, right? And everything is local on disks. Yeah? We will globalize in the next part of the talk. Yeah? So, and essentially, the idea is to change the algebraic data of a pivotal category in terms of something that is more friendly to scheme theory. That's the idea. And this is not, I mean, this gadget is not completely new. You find precursors in the literature, and even the idea to transmute a category into such type of data, you find it already in McLean's book, because you can describe an ordinary category in terms of, um, well, you take, uh, um, oriented graphs, and then um, you define a monad on this graph, and you have a module on this, uh, for this monad, and that's a category, and the information in the module of, uh, of, over this monad, that's is essentially a way to contract morphisms to compose them. And here we have also a way of composing morphisms, and um, so uh, I haven't set up the functor here for the moment. I will set it up uh, in, in a second. So we are not yet at the graphical calculus. Um, but what I want to do here is uh, to have a quick glimpse at the structure of the, this thing we were setting up. So there are several types of morphisms which we call here some operatic composition. Here is a partial trace map. There is a horizontal product and there is a whiskering. And uh, it's a combinatorial exercise to check that every um, morphism can be written as a composition of such morphisms. That's essentially you take such a disk and you use this uh, uh, consecutively to simplify the morphism. Well, so what will be important is we will introduce a category corollas connected. That's an auxiliary category where we admit just the partial trace map and the operatic compositions and we drop in the discussion the horizontal product and the whiskering. So that's why I need to discuss this structure. And uh, so that's what I will mean by connected um, corollas. Now my graphical calculus has to be set up. It has to be set up by giving a symmetric monoidal functor from corollas to vector spaces. Well, to a corolla, and the corolla has only arrows that go out, uh, how do I define a vector space? Well, we pick an auxiliary datum, which I call a polarization. So somewhere I say, this here, sh uh, these arrows should, and it's a set of neighboring arrows in general. This I consider as outgoing, as ingoing, and these ones I consider as outgoing. That's why the object here is in red and the arrow is dotted. So I'm simply taking these arrows in two groups. And the groups are such that you're just deciding at two points where you're going to cut this. So in this way, I can get a morphism here where I say this H is ingoing, this F and G are outgoing, and I can draw this in the ordinary progressive graphical calculus and assign to this a space of morphisms. Of course, we did a choice by choosing this polarization. So 
um, depending on where you cut, you could get, for example, FGH or you could GHF or FHFG. But the very nice thing about our, uh, a pivotal structure is that you can turn this around and I, since it's strict, I didn't draw the pivotal structure here, the double dual, and you can do this in this case three times and it's a nice exercise that since left duals and right duals are the same, that this here, doing this three times gives the identity. So what we get in this way is um, it, we get a diagram of vector spaces and we get distinguished isomorphisms and the vector space assigned to the corolla is simply the limit or co-limit. I mean, that doesn't matter. So, um, but remember, if I want to find a representative for the vector space associated to a corolla, I pick a polarization and there's a unique way to compare your result to mine if you're choosing different um, realizations. Now, I have a corolla, or I have a disjoint union of corollas, and I want to, I know what linear maps to assign to this here, and uh, I, this is a morphism here because I can glue this corolla here and this corolla here and get this corolla, this was the, di uh, the category where we were discussing, and now, I can pick again polarizations, evaluate this morphism, and then take um, the corresponding vector in the vector space or assigned to the corolla, and in this way, I have assigned to such a graph where I've now labeled the, uh, the, the vertices here, I have assigned to this uh, a vector in the vector space for corollas. And that's a, that's a symmetric monoidal function. So that's how I ultimately package the graphical calculus. Any questions? You look worried. Can you know what the source of the is? Well, in, in this graphical calculus on uh, um, um, in terms of corollas, I tend not to think about a morphism in terms of source and target. If I want to think about a, a source and a target of a morphism, I pick as an auxiliary tool um, this polarization and I declare anything that's here, um, if you go clockwise, that's uh, to the right, that's going to be the target, and anything here is again, again the thing changes, that's a source. But in principle, I'm thinking about this as not associating things to ingoing and outgoing and something in between, but to a corolla, a vector space. And they are both ingoing and outgoing, and that's the essence of um, having a pivotal structure. And that's important, of course, to go ultimately to oriented, uh, uh, to an oriented geometry. You can still work with ingoing and outgoing, but then your diagrammatic calculus will be two framed, and actually you can set up uh, a similar type of uh, string net or skin construction on two framed manifolds. That works out quite nicely. Yeah, so that's possible, but here we want to work with an orientation only. Good, so, uh, it, but remember this is essentially a repackaging of the data you have in a pivotal category. It's just more convenient to think about the data in this way. Well, now, I want to do this construction in the end for two pivotal categories. For the de-looping of a monoidal pivotal category, which is a specific pivotal bicategory, and I want to do it for this pivotal bicategory FROP. And it's interesting to relate these two. And of course, the first idea you get is, oh, I know what morphisms between bicategories are, right? That's uh, but that's uh, not the best idea. So let's work a bit uh, slower. So let's start by a lax functor, and uh, so it acts on objects, it acts on home um, categories, but I will ask that the composition 
is only pres uh, that there is a natural transformation. It's preserved up to a natural transformation. And this natural transformation will not be an isomorphism. And similarly, also for the unit constraint, this will not be an isomorphism. And let's introduce some graphical calculus. So uh, what you have here is um, if you pick one morphism f and g, you have a two morphism from f, capital F of f, capital F of g to this here, and this morphism goes in this direction. So that's the component of this natural transformation. And again, this natural transformation is not invertible. That's important. And uh, well, it should be natural. And this means, for example, that um, here you have this compatibility. Um, it should be, it should have a lax monoidal uh, uh, property. So there is a lax associativity and there is a lax unity. But I don't ask this to be invertible. Well, what I'm now doing is I'm taking all these diagrams and I'm reflecting and then I get the definition of an oblex structure. What is important is that uh, oblex structure and lex structure are not chosen to be in a way that they are inverses. That's what you would usually do for a two-functor. But that's not what you need. And actually, this is a structure that's um, well known in other fields. Uh, so for example, people working on linearly distributive categories, they are working with what they call uh, linear functors. I mean, the word linear are terrible for us, yeah, so don't uh, use it. And um, in this context, it's very natural to have uh, two different structures. And that's because in this context, you even have two different tensor products, so there's no direct relation between the ingoing and the outgoing tensor product. If you have lax associativity, can't you, sorry. If you have lax associativity and you have some duals, can't you just get oplax associativity just by dualizing the diagram? Um, maybe I can get it, but I don't want. Is that, what I'm saying is, do you need both conditions or one enough? Well, I will have a, in a moment a condition that relates lax associativity and oplex associativity. And then maybe we rediscuss your question. Okay. Great. Yeah? Because obviously, if I've turned this around, I need some condition. And let me, before showing it, let me introduce one operation. So if I have here a natural transformation, and this is a horizontal composition, then I can get, define what, what is called an F conjugate, a conjugate under such a functor which has a lax and an oplex structure. Um, if I apply F to the natural transformation, I get this part of the diagram. But here I'm using the oplex structure to unmultiply, and here I'm using the lax structure. And that gives me a way to uh, get from a natural transformation here, a natural transformation of this type. And now to come to your um, uh, no, let me go to your question. What we will ask, just to show it to you, is we will consider um, here the case when lax and oplax structure obey this Frobenius type condition. So these are called Frobenius monoidal functors. They are very interesting, very nice. That's actually the relation I want to have. So if you apply this to a trivial category, you will get a Frobenius algebra in the target. Yeah? And Frobenius monoidal functors are really uh, the, the thing I want to hint to. But let me go back and then um, uh, see. Uh, uh, let's first see um, what this um, F conjugation does. So what we did is suppose I have um, a, um, a bi category B, a pivotal bi category B, and a big pivotal bi category B prime. Then we have monoidal functors, 
and uh, then uh, these monoidal functors which express the graphical calculus, then by taking this F conjugation, I can transmute uh, things that label vertices in my corollas, in the morphisms of my corollas, I can transmute them from uh, corollas labeled by B to corollas labeled by B prime, and then this diagram induces a natural transformation. And this natural transformation, well, how is it given? Well, here you take um, the vector space associated to a corolla, and um, you will, um, so you choose representatives here, and then you do here this, um, um, this uh, F conjugation. Well, now, um, what is the important question here? Uh, when does F conjugation preserve a graphical calculus? And preserve a graphical calculus would mean that the natural transformation you get here is actually um, uh, an isomorphism. Yeah. So this is um, so this is the optimal case, and the optimal case is not a relevant case. The optimal case is if F is rigid, so it preserves duals, and it preserves the co-units of duals, then it also preserves the units, and if the monoidal and the op-monoidal structure are related by being inverses. You can postulate this, and uh, then you can check that such a rigid pseudo functor preserves the graphical calculus exactly. Now, this is not relevant. And what we are going to do is we will steep, still keep rigidity, but we will only ask that F is Frobenius. So these Frobenius monoidal functors, they obey compatibility of these two, um, uh, of this um, op-monoidal and the monoidal structure. And we will ask that the functor is separable. I'm not happy about being forced to require that this is separable. There should be something better in the end. But that's what we can do for the moment. So hopefully uh, I, in the future I can report something better here. Now, the, the point is that if you have a rigid Frobenius functor, then this you can show and that's work with uh, Jürgen Fuchs and Yang Yang, and I should say Yang Yang is a student who got his PhD last year, and his input to this work was absolutely essential, and many of the ideas are his. Um, so, well, if you have a rigid Frobenius functor, it preserves the connected graphical calculus, so it is compatible with operatic composition, it is compatible with the trace, but it is not compatible with, with whiskering, and it is not compatible with the um, uh, horizontal composition. So, okay, what, so what is the problem? Uh, sorry for this drawing. Uh, so if you take two, two morphisms, you can map them by your Frobenius functor to these two two morphisms and compose them. But if you are mapping them and you're doing the F conjugation, then by using uh, the naturality, uh, you get this diagram, but you see that here you have the lax structure and the oplex structure. Sorry, this is the oplex structure, this is the lax structure. We didn't ask that they are inverses. So for this reason, this guy here is not um, is not the identity. What we asked is that if you have this bubble, then you can contract it. That ensures that this here is an idempotent. So that's where we use um, uh, the separability and where separability is useful and separability is also realized in physically relevant cases, but it's not realized in all the cases we want to deal ultimately with. Okay, so now there is an important example of such a rigid separable Frobenius functor. So recall that we started with a pivotal tensor category and then um, 
uh, we, we constructed the de-looping and this bi-category, pivotal bi-category of symmetric um, separable Frobenius algebras. And by the way, Frobenius was of course needed to get this pivotal structure on this bi-category. And there is an obvious forgetful functor. So send the objects to the only object you have here, forget on the bimodules that they are bimodules and forget on bimodule morphisms that they are bimodule morphisms. And due to the separability of the Frobenius algebra, this functor here um, is actually uh, such a Frobenius functor. And you can, uh, what you need is you need to give um, a lax, an oplex uh, monoidal constraint and this is obtained by splitting the item potent here, which is in terms of the Frobenius algebra, it, you can write the tensor product of a Frobenius algebra in terms of the, as the image of this item potent. So it's given in this way and you choose a splitting here. Okay, so this is, uh, this specific forgetful functor is um, uh, a Frobenius monoidal functor. So now, uh, we construct string net models or skin, we do a skin co construction with this. So, and we do this for both the de-looping and this bi pivotal bi-category of Frobenius algebras. And you should in, keep in mind, this here will give us the conformal blocks while this here is constructed from the data we use to label the world sheet. So this describes such a world sheet. Well, so how does this work for an oriented surface? We have to pick certain boundary values. They are labeled in the way they should be. So these are objects in, to the intervals you assign objects of your bi category to the points you assign one morphisms. And then you take here the vector space that's freely generated by all labeled surfaces which have these boundary conditions. So notice that usually you say you're drawing graphs on a surface, but now since I'm in a bi category, I'm also labeling the two patches. And then you're dividing out by um, uh, n of sigma b, that's the null, uh, the space of null graphs. So that's the subspace that's given by local relations that are given by the graphical calculus. So if on this disk, which is here shaded, and on this disk, these two things evaluate to the same value for the external corolla, I'm going to identify these graphs. More generally, I take here the subspace, um, which is generated by graphs, which are the same outside all, um, outside the disk, and which um, uh, the graphs have the properties to intersect the disk transversely, and if the linear combination of the graphs evaluates to zero, I say it's in N of sigma. So in this sense, the string net spaces globalize the, um, uh, globalize the graphical calculus. Well, um, a bit more formally, and that's a hint for you. Uh, you can say um, we set up an evaluation functor from graphs on uh, the, the manifold um, uh, sigma to vect. Well, how do we do this? The objects of graphs are partially colored surfaces, partially because the vertices are not colored. The morphisms are given by identifying here a disk, and then you assign to a graph um, the tensor product of the vector spaces that you have for the vertices, because the vertices are surrounded by corollas, and for uh, the morphisms you simply assign, you take the map that's given by the graphical calculus. So the best way to think about this string net tensor if you want to, string, uh, the string net construction is you have this evaluation function functor from a category of labeled graphs to vector spaces and then the string net space happens to be a co-limit. Now if you want to do anything in a derived world, you can reasonably take the homotopy co-limit and that will provide uh, constructions of this type. And of course you have to work here and Hisham, when should I stop? I don't remember when I started because there were... 15, I think, yeah, 15. Okay, good. Yeah, so um, 
what is more or less clear is that the mapping class group acts on this string net space um, because uh, we have even a geometric action, it acts on these graphs and it's compatible with these local relations and sewing holds so we have a um, modular functor. Well, so what you do usually here in this situation is uh, you can work in two directions. You can try to go from two manifolds up to three manifolds and ask whether this can be done. This is not of interest here because we want to work on two-dimensional conformal field theories and we have already the mapping class group. So that what is interesting is to go down and understand what do you assign to closed oriented manifolds and which type of category. And well, what you do is you construct a cylinder category. Uh, well, that's um, essentially it's an, it's an enhanced and geometric and conceptual ver version of the tube algebra, if you wish. So uh, anyhow, uh, so um, we want to do this not only for circles, but also for intervals. And to this end, we note that these two categories have a distinguished object. Well, for, um, uh, the, uh, uh, for the delooping, there's one object anyhow only. And for the Frobenius uh, categ by category, uh, the monoidal unit is a Frobenius algebra. And then what do we do? So for example, if our one manifold looks like this, then we, uh, what we do is we set up a category where uh, for an object of this type and some other object, we take all diagrams on cylinders and we construct the corresponding string net space. This gives a linear category and uh, this linear category is very nice. This linear category is compatible with embeddings. So that's why I want to work with a double category because I have embeddings of one manifold. So it's compatible, the construction is compatible with this, but still I want to keep the two manifolds as a different type of morphisms between the one manifold. And I have also a compatibility of this construction under embedding of two manifolds. I'm skipping these details here. Yeah? So these are the two directions and that's why it's nice to have these two different types of one morphisms. Uh, okay, now these categories are usually not maybe the way they are, they, but you can complete them in various ways. This whole talk at the moment when I, I'm supposed to give it, works with projectors, with, sim uh, with separability, so the appropriate thing to get the objects I need is to add idempotence to idempotent complete. This can be done. If you idempotent complete, then in fact the cylinder category for the interval turns out to be C, and the idempotent completed category for S1 is the Trinfeld center. And the nice thing which illustrates this uh, covariance under embeddings is that the embedding of the interval to S1 gives a functor that's very well known. It's the left adjoint of the um, um, forgetful functor from the Trinfeld center to C. Well, the left adjoint isn't a big deal. Uh, we're applying this here to unimodular categories and for unimodular categories, left adjoint and right adjoint are canonically isomorphic. Now, um, also the string net spaces can be carubified. Let me skip this here. And uh, for fusion categories, this can be extended uh, to a three to one TFT, which is equivalent and to the Turaev Viro construction. So one can also prove factorization and factorization means that um, if you if you are gluing these uh, surfaces and if they have boundary data which allow gluing, then this you get morphisms which exhibit um, the string net space for the glued surface as a co-end of uh, the um, 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 uh, 
for these gluing morphisms. Actually, there's a conceptual reason I was introducing these labeled categories for a surface. What happens is that if you glue a surface, then the category for the glued surface is a homotopy co-limit over the categories before gluing, and homotopy co-limits commute. That's why the string net construction behaves well with gluing. Unfortunately, this cannot be found in the literature, so uh, this will be some work we have to do. And in this way, we get a modular functor which actually uh, takes values in pro functors, so um, we have constructed uh, what we want to do. And now I can go to discuss this application to rational CFTs. So I'm starting remember with such a worksheet which is labeled exactly by decoration data in this pivotal bi-category of Frobenius algebras. So unsurprisingly, if I start with this worksheet, I, well, I have to do a little trick. I don't want to talk about boundaries here, so I'm adding these uh, things that are shaded in gray and remember that our pivotal by categories have been pointed. So I'm labeling the new gray uh, cells with the distinguished object in the pointed category. This is harmless in the sense that um, this is anyway the monoidal unit and any left module over the, um, a, a is a bimodule where on the other side uh, you are acting with the monoidal unit. So anyhow, that's a technical point. And then you see that you're getting something. And now we do not have, um, we, we want to go now from this uh, into this functor, which, sorry, in the string net construction for this um, uh, de-looping, so for this uh, pivotal by category. Our functor wasn't good enough to, um, uh, to respect the graphical calculus. It didn't respect whiskering and the horizontal composition. But you can compensate this by adding on these two cells a network of graphs. So we call this a Frobenius network. So it should be fine enough. So then if it's fine enough, you know that any triangulation by Frobenius algebras gives the same result. That's the compatibility of Pachner moves and Frobenius algebras. There's nothing to think about this. And uh, so in this way, I get given a, um, a word sheet as I get here this complemented word sheet and I get here a diagram which gives me a vector in this string net space. Yeah? I'm not sure how to phrase this question exactly, but your Frobenius, um, uh, your Frobenius, what was the right choice of yeah. word? Frobenius uh, triangulation? No, not triangulation. Yeah. The, the the way you use the corollas. Yeah. That was a, it was a planar construction. It was on the plane, right? But now you're imposing it on it some topology of the Riemann surface. Yeah. Is there something to check that you could? do something locally and it is well defined globally? Uh, I, like yes, I said, there is something to check and that's what I was trying to allude to. Um, if you are choosing a different dual of a triangulation, that's what it really is, than I do, then there's a set of moves right. which brings me from one to the other. This is essentially Pachner moves. Ah. And Pachner moves are, uh, ex well, they are the geometric analog of the defining relations of Frobenius algebra. That's why it works out. I see. So this is a very two-dimensional in 2D. This is a two-dimensional thing. Absolutely correct. I see. Yeah. Pachner moves are not two-dimensional. Pachner works in any dimension. And, um, but I'm using it here definitely in a two-dimensional setting. Okay. Completely so correct just to understand. So you have some local construction, you're globalizing it, and you check something that, that yes. you could, okay, All right, thank you. And the fact that I can compensate here by this triangulation, to be honest, it's not how I want to see uh, that the theory ultimately looks like. It's what we can do now. It gives non-trivial results, but uh, it doesn't make me completely happy, but we are rarely completely happy in our lives, right? 
As mathematicians, I mean. <laughs> okay. Yeah? Pachner move uh, give you a special case of cobordism between uh, the decorated surfaces you have here. Do you expect that in general you could have uh, a cobordism between, uh, action between? I think uh, next step. Uh, <laughs> I hope so. Here. Really, yeah. I mean that's. Uh, I mean what you are alluding to. Let me phrase it differently. If you look at Pachner moves differently then um, they are secretly a bit three-dimensional. And the way to imagine it yeah, is... Not so quickly there. Yeah, and the, mate, the way Pachner was imagining it is that he lets, uh, he drops little tetrahedra on a given yes. triangulation and that gives flips. Yes. Of course, this is very reminiscent to what we've seen uh, in Kovanov's talks to foams. Mm. And um, I hope that something works out, but I didn't have time to look at this so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, really, you're completely correct. There, there will be some deeper story hidden, and I will show you something at the end which points in this direction as well. Yeah, so, okay. So now, uh, the nice thing is if you uh, look at the boundary fields and we know what to associate from previous work in CFTs, for example, these internal homes, well, these internal homes can be very naturally realized in terms of um, idempotents in these categories. So we are using this, so we are putting these idempotents on the boundary. We are doing this also on the circles. And then I'm a bit speeding up because there's one point that's really important. That's the one I announced for Christian's question. Well, then we are ending up with this following uh, thing. Well. We take here our word sheet, and then the, the decoration data are exactly what we have for this bicategorical uh, skin construction based on this bicategory of Frobenius algebras. So, almost tautologically, this geometry on which we want to construct our quantum field theory gives a vector in this uh, vector space, our bicategorical skin construction assigns to the surface. So then, um, and we call this vector the quantum world sheet. Um, this will have a better justification, but these days quantum is so overused that you don't have to justify it to, to its use anyhow. I'm not referring to your center, Kishap. So, yeah, so. Uh, anyhow, yeah, so, and then, uh, so we have uh, this Frobenius monoidal functor which allows us to transport this here, and you see that the construction of correlators factorizes, and it factorizes in this sense, a correlator is a vector here which has certain properties. And this here is the tautological map which given a word sheet takes this in this skin theoretic construction based on FROB C, and it takes simply the class of the graph in this, uh, in this vector space. Here, uh, the Frobenius monoidal functor from FROB C to the delooping of C, this gives us a, a map morphism between the string net spaces because it respects graphical calculus up to something which we compensate by the Frobenius networks. And then you see that here, if you have two world sheets, sig S, which give the same vector here, they will have the same uh, correlator. So this map here is a systematic relation which explains identities between CFT correlators. And not only identities, we are in a quantum field theory, it also explains linear relations between CFT correlators. So even if you're not interested in this defect business and stratified manifolds, you should be interested because modding out by these defects in this string net construction gives you systematic relations between CFT correlators. And this is conceptually something new in quantum field theory that um, the defect stuff and this decoration stuff leads to relations of correlators. And I would hope that this is a fairly robust picture which you can find in other realizations of quantum field theories. 
So that's, um, and you can obtain here, we call this map here the universal correlator because the, the real correlator can be obtained as a pullback. Yeah, so that's the reason for this word. And so this is really a source which unifies relations and identities between these correlators. So now, um, this is something I said. So what you see is that this conformal field theory cannot detect the complete world tree geometry as a stratified uh, two-manifold with this labeling. It can only see uh, the image you get in this space of quantum world sheets. So, and so it can only see what's uh, living in this space which you constructed from defects. That's the, that's the lesson you learn. Now coming back to the, in, in the very last minute, so here I might try to stick on time, uh, coming back to the issue of mapping class groups because that started the whole thing. Um, look at these two different world sheets and let's assume that X is an invertible defect, it's an invertible bimodule, so invertible means that X tensor X dual is the monoidal unit or put differently, I can, um, I have this identity locally. Yeah? So it's obvious that these two things gives, these two world sheets give the same vector in our space of quantum world sheets. And hence, since our correlators uh, factor through this space of quantum world sheets, um, uh, they have the same correlators. They cannot be distinguished by the CFT. If you look at this geometrically, is the Dane twist part of the mapping class group or not? Well, if you see this here, you would say no, because if you do a Dane twist, then uh, by a chewing gum effect, <laughs> it will not be the same. Uh, here you would say yes. So our geometric definition of mapping class group is inappropriate here. Yeah. So we have to define the, the invariance of the correlators under something in a different way. And so what we do is the mapping class group acts on this space uh, of quantum world sheets, which we got from this skin theoretic construction. And uh, now we define uh, the relevant mapping class group as the stabilizer of this vector. That's only taking care of this vector and that's what's the true relevant mapping class group of this, uh, this situation. And then you see that here, the Dehn twist is not obtained in the, uh, in, the, um, uh, in the geometric mapping class group, but it is in the stabilizer because this and this have the same vector, so the stabilizers must be the same. So this is really what you should use to formulate your covariance uh, of the correlators uh, in a reasonable way. And yeah, so well for this audience I should probably summarize some of the findings here. So um, we have this category of co cobordisms. It's actually, you should upgrade this to a symmetric monoidal double category, as I have alluded to. All the functors should be upgraded to symmetric monoidal double functors. And then you see that the essence of CFT correlators is captured in such a monoidal vertical uh, uh, transformation, which comes from a Frobenius monoidal functor and not a functor of bi categories. Well, so. The string net or skin theoretic constructions are very natural conceptual homes for this investigation of CFT correlators. And uh, it is the, uh, that is bi-categorical string net construction based on FROPC captures the symmetries and the observable aspect of uh, the geometry on which you are considering your quantum field theory. And while well, outlook uh, this construction has the potential to be generalized beyond semi-simplicity. Actually, we want to generalize it beyond rigidity. That's very natural. If you think about the mathematical origin of Frobenius monoidal functors, Frobenius monoidal functors have been considered for linearly distributive categories. And uh, these categories which you have beyond rigidity are in particular um, distributive. And um, well, I've alluded to go to homotopical versions. There are even 
uh, fan fancy and fashionable reasons to do this. And well, you have been asking a two-dimensional. I think many of the things uh, that I told you are written up and worked out in a way that's specific to two dimensions, but some of the lessons should persist in higher dimensions. Um, in particular, I think the fact that these defect data are a way to organize relations between uh, some uh, correlators, that's a very important aspect. I cannot comment on how this is related to invertible symmetries, a topic that's fashionable in other contexts, but this is at least something which realizes things at the level of mathematical theorems in a tractable class of quantum field theories. Thank you. Questions for Christoph? Alex. Okay. Uh, one maybe vague question. So you say you, when you generalize to the homotopical context, so then you generate through the co-limit potentially some higher cohomology groups. Uh, do you have any feeling if that will be a lot of homotopical content generated or not? Because whether this, uh, if if when you define these, these yes. string net spaces yeah. or complexes. You, you do a certain co-limit. Do, yes. do you know if that has a chance of generating a lot of homotopical content, or is it like a complex which is mostly concentrated in degree zero? Um, I have a feeling, and I have a few results. Yeah, so let me say, um, it, the complexes will have little homotopical content as long as you are working with surfaces with boundaries. If you're working with closed surfaces, you will get variants of Hochschild complexes and Hochschild complexes with uh, coefficients. Okay. And um, if you're asking me, are these, um, now Hochschild complexes, that's of course very well known in this case. Uh, these are Hochschild complexes with mapping class group actions. I can only do a toy example at the moment, which is um, work with, um, a finite group over a field of a finite characteristic, because that's a cheap way to do uh, semi-simplicity, non-semi-simplicity. Non the answer is, if the group is abelian, essentially the construction doesn't yield really new, interesting stuff. You can understand everything by saying that the stuff you get is a module over um, x from the monoidal unit to itself. So that's what I understand by trivial. If it is non-abelian, there is more stuff in higher degrees, and these are substantially new representations of mapping class groups that show up. Okay. Yes, there will be new content. And do you have a feeling what is the CFT interpretation of these higher structures you see there? I have many questions. And even if you are in this realm, right? Um, you, I was formulating the question of uh, as a, identifying a CFT correlator as a vector in a certain vector space. Even this formulation doesn't literally make sense. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, and this is a point where I know how to continue mathematically, but um, I don't have any physical intuition for this. But that's probably lack of lack of knowledge from my side. Yeah. Well, I think everybody has that problem. That physical interpretation is unclear always. Any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Christoph again for the very nice talk. Thank you, Christoph. <laughs>